Good morning, everyone. Uh, well, it's morning for me. It's about 2.15 a.m. in the morning. I'm preparing for a night shift, so I'm staying up a bit late. And being the Christmas period, it's very, very busy, and I'm uh, on my last legs to get the episode out for you all. Uh, I had a desire to finish the season with a, a special end-of-year season uh, episode where I brought guests back, and um, and that's what I've done this time, to, to have a forum with some of my guests to discuss some of the greatest topics of the year. And so I'd like to thank Eva, Stephen and Tony for being involved. The, the episode's truly awesome and in, in my humble opinion, it's, um, uh, it's a great lesson. So, but firstly, I'd like to reflect a personal outcome for my own acting journey this year. In the latter part of this year, I was given some advice about my acting and, and lack of traction in the industry that was a real downer on my self-esteem acting-wise. It led me to question my ability as an actor, the strength of my acting delivery, so to speak, and whether it was worth continuing on this journey at all. I reached out to some of my mentors for their um, take on the information I'd received, and I'd like to share a, a quick summary with you all before diving into this episode. But um, uh, first, uh, I'd like to thank uh, Eva, who's on this episode, uh, Andrew Hell from my online drama training, stagemilk.com, uh, casting director Greg Apps, uh, who was on an earlier episode as well from the Audition Technique, Tony Knight, who's also returning in this episode, and finally, um, Jeff Seymour, aka the real-life actor, who will be my first guest for season two in 2023. And so the advice, support, and positive reinforcement they all gave me was uh, was truly appreciated, and um, you know, it, it lifted my spirit back to the motivational level that I needed to be at to continue on this journey. So I, I, I thank you all. Uh, for your, your your advice was truly well received, and I know that you delivered it honestly and openly, and, and I certainly appreciate that. To that end, I, I have learned that um, my a my acting delivery doesn't suck. I have a skill set that certainly delivers, and is certainly capable of being attributed to many characters available in Australian productions and 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 overseas productions. I must note that it was mentioned that the advice that I initially heard may not have been meant in the way that I took it. Or it, will, or it was delivered in the wrong manner, uh, being more of advice maybe that I needed to hear. But it was a clear point that I had to put my position in the acting game into perspective, that I am a 40 to 50-year-old Caucasian male, of which I am a new player, essentially, a reasonably experienced in comparison to the large cohort of actors with years and years of professional experience behind them. And post-COVID, they're, they're all vying for for any work really these days, even the 20 word is making my goal of a professional credit even harder to attain in the short term. And finally, I, I was given the advice by two of my mentors to find some scenes that truly resonate with me and my character strengths and, and put them on camera for delivery for casting directors. This is purely to showcase that I can deliver beyond the everyday scenes, so to speak, that I, I do in normal self-tapes or, or auditions to showcase that I can attain new levels and, and, and bring out new characters. So that's what I'd, I'd like to do. So 2023 brings to me some well-needed changes, I feel. I'm now assessing where I'm at and, um, and I'm really looking forward to that. And, I, uh, and certainly uh, looking forward to sharing that journey with you as we go into season two. So I hope you stay for the journey. I'm confident some some great guests and some great discussions next year. So thank you again for, for being active listeners on my podcast. I, I love that you all get something positive from each episode each month. So please reach out and let me know what you think, how you feel, and let me know um, what you'd like to hear on future episodes, or, or just let me know how your journey is going. So cheers, Merry Christmas, and I wish you all the very best in 2023, every one of you that's listening uh, and future um, guests, if you're listening in 2023, so I hope your journey is going really well and thank you for joining the podcast. May you all attain uh, what you desire and, and strive for in your own journey. Now, let's head into this uh, end of season special for 2022 and um, I hope you like it. Cheers, everyone. Well, good morning, guys. Good morning. Uh, we are coming live uh, for episode 12 and someone's beeping in the background. So if you've got your social media open or something, uh, you could close that. I remember telling Tony in our interview, make sure everything's closed. And then I left my Facebook open because I was waiting to message him in case he couldn't get on. And it was me beeping in the background. So <laughs> we're on episode 12 today. Uh, it's a, I know on my last episode, I said it was the last one for the year, but um, I lied a little bit. Um, I'm calling this the end of season special or the Christmas special. And I've tried to bring back some guests 
from the year so we can just um, do something a little bit different, get some guests to meet each other and discuss the highlights of um, what we um, determined over the year through for the late bloomer actor. So I'd like to introduce everyone uh, first uh, for the people listening to the podcast. Obviously, you can't see faces, so I'll get, um, I'm going to ask a question for each guest to um, answer when I introduce them so people know their voice. So uh, as I go through you guys, um, I just want you to quickly say in about one sentence or so your favourite moment in 2022 or something you took away from the episode that we did together. So uh, first, I'd like to introduce from my very first episode in January, uh, where she recorded out of New York, but she's now coming to you live from Malaysia. Wonderful actress and great friend, Eva Jalak, and I pronounced your name properly this time. <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, I've got to say, it's an absolute honour to be here with Stephen and Tony. I can't, like, I'm kind of a little chilly about it. That was lame. I'm sorry. <laughs> That's sweet. Where about in Malaysia? In, I'm are kind you? of halfway through work mode and light mode. And <clears throat> I'm in uh, selling gore, or paddling gaia. So working on a, a we've just finished working on a Halloween attraction at Sunway Lagoon theme park. Um, it's the sec, it's the biggest, one of the biggest uh, Halloween events in Southeast Asia, second only to Universal Studios. And now we're we're just packing up and finishing things up. So sorry, that's a bit convoluted. So that's where I am. Awesome, Eva. And what did you take away from 2022, either personally or from our episode? Uh, well, from our episode, I learned that I'm very good at running off one now. <laughs> talking, talking, talking. Uh, and, uh, but awesome. I think uh, my highlight for 2022 was, was getting back on the acting course after having a, like, a miserable experience. So was good. Vincent put me in a short film and um, I performed in front of 3,000 people a night for 16 nights here at the Halloween event. So that was another good highlight for me to like boost my confidence and go, yes, like I'm ready to get back into it. Awesome. Awesome. And uh, we may uh, discuss some of that in the uh, next half hour or so. Uh, thank you, Eva. And next up from episode three, Brisbane-based actor and voiceover artist and Spider Whisperer, if you've listened to the episode <laughs> or watched TikTok. Uh, Mr. Stephen Walker, welcome. Yeah. That'd, be, that'd be me. <laughs> How are we all? Great Good. to be here. Thank you for coming, Stephen. <laughs> I hope you're nice and dry in Adelaide. It's, the rain's just coming back at the moment, so we've had some good downfalls here, but uh, not as much as Victoria, I don't think. So, And what did you do take away from 2022, Stephen, either personally or... Um, uh, from our episode. Look, I, I guess the thing that I'm I'm excited by is a, a short film that I'm that I'm a, a play a supporting role in um, is just just sweeping awards everywhere, and it's one of the one of the actor short film um, finalists. And so, any time now, the voting is closed last week, and so we'll see whether it actually picks up an actor. Awesome. So um, I'm excited by that. An actor Very as in exciting. a double ACTA award. Yes, awesome. yeah, not, a, not actor. I know, I say that all the <laughs> actor. time. Actor, <laughs> actor. I love it. So, yeah, so that's, that's, a, that's been a highlight is just seeing that film in its progression. Awesome, awesome. And last but certainly not least from episode number nine, a fellow Adelaidean a acting teacher, and I know he doesn't like this word, but I'll say it anyway, Tony, uh, a mentor, uh, Mr. Tony Knight. Welcome. I'm going to kill you. <laughs> mentor. <laughs> um, I'm just thinking, thinking, do you know what I think, and I, I would say it's the same with Stephen and Eva and yourself, is 2022 has been a year of resilience. But by being resilient, good things have happened. And I have done more work this year than I have done in ages. I've done five shows, mm. five theatre shows, back, virtually all back to back, all successful. And... Um, I, and I look at the shows that I've done, which is, includes Constellations and whatever happened to Mary Jane and just recently Reasonable Doubt, and I, um, they're all what I would call worthy plays. I'm not really into worthy theatre at the moment. I'm a bit over worthy theatre. But I've, my, myself have done three uh, bits of worthy theatre, and I think of all the ones that I've done, the one that had the biggest impact on me was um, this uh, play by Wendy Harmer and Sansia Robinson called Whatever Happened to 
Mary Jane, which dealt with anorexia nervosa and a teenage girl. Mm, I remember that. And uh, that one has had, that's still staying with me, even though it was, month, it was finished months ago. It, um, it had a profound effect, partly because a little bit like Constellations, the audiences were, we had people really, really quite affected by it. Um, uh, mothers bringing teenage girls to talk about anorexia nervosa. It was quite a confronting thing. And David, where that came from is also, after our, our, our talk, I did do a sort of restock. And you know, it's been a pretty bleak couple of years for all of us. And you kind of go, um, you do a reassessment whenever you do one of these sort of podcast things and you go, and they're good to do a re, a re, a re take on all the, everything. And um, I realised that at 65, I don't really have very much to complain about. I thought I'd be retired and sort of like not doing anything. And as you know, David, I've tried many times to stop yes. and I just don't stop. And I kind of think, I find I'm, I've, I am, in, I feel like I'm heading into, into a senior statesman period, you know, because I, I get that at the schools I go and I look around and I look at all the young teachers and all the young people and I realise very quickly I'm the oldest person in the room. And I kind of feel like I'm turning into this sort of like, strange old grandpa well, that, <laughs> then you're gonna to have to choose then do you want to go with the word mentor or senior statesman i think maybe we'll senior go. statesman that's okay. that's a lot of, that's better well uh, that, that sort of uh, leads into a probably question i had later on but uh steve and eva um uh, how has coming out of the um the COVID um two years affected you guys i know eva you were stuck between uh two countries essentially weren't you? you couldn't get back to the states to see your better half and and malaysia was on hold uh, and i think you mm. managed to get back to australia for a little while so are you happy that we're out of that now and you've got a bit of freedom to get back to where you need to be uh it's it's that's the um, oh, my brain's conflicted already thinking about the question i, I thought i'm kind of a little disgusted in myself for not taking the opportunity i think that like however horrible COVID was, I think that was a great opportunity for us as humans to just reset, reset, rethink priorities mm -hmm. and what we want to do with our lives and how we treat each other and, and things like that. And I don't think I took advantage of that. I had that good gap to, despite the travel um, and getting to see family and, and all of that, I had an opportunity to turn things around and do things that I really want to do. Oh. And I don't think I did because now I'm back to the kind of daily grind with my job and I'm not really like doing what I want to do. <laughs> so that, <laughs> but it hasn't, but yeah, but it hasn't stopped me. Yeah. Carrying on. No, I, guess, I don't know. Mm. Where was I going with that? <laughs> <laughs> that way. Uh, and Stephen, um, Stephen, you had a bit different. You didn't need to travel, but Gold Coast, Queensland and stuff like that, you still had a lot of work on really during COVID. They, they, a lot of the feature films and TV shows that were made, they came up with ways of working around COVID. And I think a lot of American project productions came over. So that was probably yeah. a positive for yeah. you. It was, it was a, a, a boon for um, Queensland and, and the Gold Coast and, and actors who are based here because a lot of productions, particularly NBC, Netflix, and the streamers, they set up shop and they, um, you know, one, two series, whatever it might've been, um, uh, seasons, I mean. Um, and it, it really showed that we, that, that the Queensland system could actually step up and deliver something that the producers couldn't get in the States. Mm -hmm. Um, and um, I, all sorts of you know bizarre ways of doing things. I was doing um, uh, COVID training courses online and attending COVID briefings and doing all sorts of stuff just to make sure that everyone was compliant. And whether it be working in bubbles and and different you know different pods that didn't connect with each other and so on. Lots of different ways to to get around doing it um, to get around sort of potential um, infection mm. and. Um, uh, it it really it really helped, and so it was a uh, it was an extraordinary extraordinary period. Not not all of it, not not the totality of 2020, but but um, certainly big chunks of 2020 were a, a, an advantage. And it, I think it just um, it really highlighted that you know if you had, if you had your self tape game working, it helped you mm. because mm. those people who were new to self tape. Uh, I think there is a disadvantage when, when that was everything switched off and all, 
all um, uh, selections and all, all casting was done that way. Uh, and now I think we we're in that stage of if you, you know, if you do not have your self tape game up, just forget it. The world's moved on. Don't even bother trying. Yeah, because self tapes are now uh, even post COVID are going to be the thing. I think. I think they, the casting yeah. directors have seen the positive of it that they can see a lot more people in one hit. So, whether that's a pro or a con for actors, I'm not sure. Um, I've done. I listened to probably a good odd twenty different acting podcasts, um, which keeps me busy. But a lot of them, when they talk about their self tapes, is it's it's all that discussion about um, not having that uh, one-on-one with the casting director you've lost that now because you're not in the room they still do callbacks either via zoom or actually in the room Mm. now but that initial self-tape that you put in um, not only now uh, do you just not hear about it you're actually not even getting a feedback in the room when you first do your first audition so it's making a lot of things for actors uh, even more difficult because they're just not hearing anything a bit different in the states they're doing you know, actors can do 20 self-tapes a, a week. So um, we're lucky if we mm. do that a year. <laughs> I'm lucky if I do 20 mm. in 10 years. But um, it, yeah, it's exactly. an interesting thing, isn't it? So sort of discussing with the COVID, it's most people when I ask that question, try to look at the positives that we've got from coming out of COVID, not the negatives. Uh, me working at airport, I see a lot of the negatives, how it's changed people. But from an acting perspective, mm. it's great that you guys have seen the positives of it. So... Tony is, yeah, and, sorry, go on. And, and, and just to, to sort of close that, being able to be, I think there's at least, oh, at least four or, or maybe five, I don't, can't think now, over the last um, 18 months, 18 months stretching into two years probably, but, but certainly 18 months where I've been cast uh, in, in co-star roles or TVCs off the, the single self-tape. Nice. You know, so so not even not even callbacks, just um, you know, bang done. Thanks, got got what we want. Here's yeah. the here's the gig. So um, oh. that I don't think we've seen that before pre COVID. Cool. And just quickly, Tony, before I go on to another question, post COVID now for theatre, you said you've done five this year. Has mm-hmm. it changed the way audiences come into uh, things, or are the audiences oh. back? <clears throat> no, no, the audiences are not back. It um, it depends on what it is. Like um, we did really good houses for reasonable doubt, but that's t- and we did good houses for uh, constellations. I, I think everywhere in the theatre, it still is this battle, and this is internationally as well. It's trying to get people back in, and look, we're about to hit another wave. You know, hopefully, uh, and the um, unfortunately, the city that seems to be most impacted by these waves is is um, is Melbourne. Um, but then it gets it has more live theatre on it than anywhere else, really. So. Uh, I think everywhere is finding it. I mean, there are close shows that are closing because of of, of COVID or have closed. Um, I mean, I, I find it with the mouse trap on at the moment. I find it fascinating that the mouse trap in London was forced to close, so that put an end to that seventy over seventy year run of the longest play that's ever been running. Um, and uh, yeah, so that's the end of that tradition. But I think look. I'm always going to be positive. Like I hated all that stuff during COVID that the theatre was dead. And that's when I did Shakespeare in the Bar, just found somewhere. I kind of went, no, look, it's only dead if we allow it to be dead. And um, and I agree with Eva. I thought COVID gave us an opportunity to reset, rethink and actually do new things. And I, where I've been a little bit disappointed is um, I watched how companies in the United States and in Europe and in um and the UK adapted to the COVID situation. I mean, for example, the Royal, Royal Shakespeare Company never closed. They just went out into parks. And this whole, and the whole thing about doing um, plays and theatre or anything in different venues, um, I thought we had an opportunity to do something different, but we didn't. And, the, and, you know, this is back to the old normal. We've gone back to the old normal. It's comfortable. It's assured, but we're inside. We're back inside the festival centre, temples, and oh, yeah. this is where people go. And it's it's so expensive, and um, I don't know how people can afford to go to the theatre. I really don't because it's mm. so expensive. Yeah. So I think there's a lot of problems associated, but there'll there will always be audiences. That's always good. good. That's good. Yeah. And I've just noticed um, there's. Uh, I don't know if you guys are aware of this, Eva, Stephen. There, there's a new company uh, called out by. Oh, I've forgotten the actor's name. He's from. Um, uh, from a country practice, uh, they've just started uh, 
recording live theatre and you can stream it on the internet yes. now. So uh, live theatre Australia or something like that. So I, I think that might be a good thing for actors and for for people to get to theatre, especially when we're talking going back to post pre COVID, and the cost is still up there. So uh, so that's a good thing. Uh, I've certainly streamlined all the national stuff. I'm I, I subscribe to National Live and. I recommend it to everybody because it's actually terrific and you do see some extraordinary things with great actors, but it's not the live experience. No, of it's course just... not. But for seven ninety nine a month, it's a, it's a good way for people to get in there. Mm. Uh, guys, I, I want to have a quick chat for one of the biggest things that are brought up in our um, interviews uh, with the two actors we have in the room and Tony being a, a, a long-time NIDA and teacher and boss. Uh, education uh, was a big thing that we've discussed, uh, especially in relation to late bloomers, you know, us oldies. Uh, it seems it takes the late bloomers, we might pretty much have to rely on the short courses and the workshop approach to increase our acting, acting acumen. Uh, I know we've discussed it uh, one-on-ones and before, but um, Stephen, Eva, what's your thoughts on, on that as a, as a collective here and with a, a, an acting teacher in the room? <laughs> I'm, one, I'm listening. <laughs> Acting teacher and mentor, I believe. Um, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Look, I, when when I was when I was sort of coming back to 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 uh, to acting, it was I, I used to say I, I I need to now play catch up. I need to play catch up. I need to play catch up. Mm. It didn't in, in one sense, and while I still look to the right course and the right um, uh, acting teacher, not so much, you know, not talking about um, casting director courses, but learning a discipline, learning an approach, learning a philosophy. Um, I I did realise relatively early on that, okay, while, while from a technical perspective, maybe missing out on a three-year um, NIDA or WAPA course uh, put me behind in some degree, the fact that I was coming at this at a, as a as a fifty year old, I bought something else. I bought something else that could not be taught. I bought something that that comes with experience and knowledge. And whether it just be raising kids or just you know living through grief or experiencing moving around, traveling the world, or doing any number of things that I can bring to um, I can bring to an ensemble. So as of that uh, uh, call it. I don't know, a sense of maturity or something or other, I don't know, cohesiveness. I can bring something to characters that I'm not going to be able to pick up in a, a course. And yes, I'm not going to be able to play the 16-year-old cheerleader, but I don't want to. You can try. <laughs> <a> whole lot... <laughs> I can try, I can try, but it's the hairline. Um, I And so I, I soon realised that I wasn't playing catch-up at all. I was actually just looking for the things that suited me and where I was at with my life that could tap into what, the, the, the real life um, experiences that I had and apply that to this new craft. And so I'm very, very, very comfortable in that space now. I love that answer. That is just fantastic. And I think that's pretty much what we got out of our discussion together as well. Uh, Eva, I think you're pretty much on the same ballpark there, are you? Yeah, absolutely. And also I think a work ethic as well. Because we've had those daytime jobs yeah. and we've had those, like you said, the life experiences. We, we, we bring a certain work ethic to the stage, to the set uh, as, uh, as well, which I think is, um, I think it would be interesting if, I haven't come across it, but I think it would be another aspect to teach, uh, would be work ethic and just education on what happens on set and who's on set. And, because it, it gets lightly brushed over but I think uh, like everybody on stage and everyone on set is a team and there's a certain amount of respect and knowledge that should be shared there uh, mm. and a work ethic, conscious of time, conscious of what people do. It's not all about the act. I mean, I'm, my, my saying is it's all about me because it is. But I think when you're in that working environment, it's important to be, know, be aware that you're part of a team and kind of not crush but and not bring down, that's not the quiet word, but just kind of lighten that. I'm the star, I'm the actor kind of thing. Where's, where's my trailer sort of ego? Yeah, that. Is that what you because mean? I, I, yeah. I, I don't know about you, David yeah. and Stephen, but I mean, David and I are probably on a lower level than you, Stephen, because we're, we're still doing the independent oh, theatres and, and, the, and, the, and the student <laughs> theatres and helping out with that. But I'm still surprised about how many actors come into those spaces. 
with an ego. And it, it affects a little mm. disappointing. And you, you don't want to be that old fart that, you know, kind of, you know, this is an area going, you know, kind of calm down a little bit. It, that's, yeah. <laughs> I get that. And, um, but, you, but you know where I'm coming from, <laughs> Hey, but don't get me wrong. I do love a trailer. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Full of coffee. <laughs> I, haven't had, I haven't had my own trailer yet. Who's had their own trailer? Steven, you? Yeah, yeah I've had my own trailer. Oh, there you go. Oh, my there God. What's go. it like? What's it like? What's it like having a trailer, Stephen? You know, you, you know what? It's lonely. Uh-huh. And, and and because you know, the first the first trailer I ever got was during COVID, and it, and so there was like there's no one to talk to, yeah. you know. And I, I guess that's being so used to being a, a part of a team. I like to engage and connect and talk to people, you know, and find out mm. what's what, who's doing what. Um, but it was it was isolating. Bang! Here's your wardrobe. We'll uh, we'll call you when we're going to set. It's like oh, and I, I love okay. it what what you've both just said there. <laughs> um, for for late bloomers and having ex- life experience, um, I episode drop it uh, today for my Nova my November episode with uh, Andrea Osvart out of Hungary, um, international um, actress. She's been in the states and stuff like that, and she talked. To, she loves to work with late bloomers herself. She considered herself a late bloomer, and she said that um, the older actor, whether they're coming from a trained background as a youngster or late to the game, uh, brings character to their character was a good way to put it. So, uh, Tony, if I can uh, dive to you a little bit, we discussed this a lot about Mm. that very thing about um, older actors bringing character to character, but we also discussed the switching between going from stage to film and film the stage, and that all ties into the both. So um, uh, could you just elaborate a little bit on that discussion? And I'd be interested to see what Stephen and Eva have to say about... um, trying to do the stage work uh, without having that background from Whopper or NIDA? Well, I, look, I, I certainly agree with how the, it's trended over the last, say, 10, maybe longer years. <clears throat> I don't think it's, in, it's necessary to do a three-year BA course anymore. Um, <clears throat> but there are advantages of doing that. And one of them is actually supposed to be associated with skills, um, and particularly the voice and how the body moves on in the theatre as opposed to working on camera. Um, you do need to have a confidence in working on that stage. Um, and, I, of course, I hate actors being mic'd. I just hate it. Mm. And um, and I know I do notice uh, it's – look, I am sounding like an old fart, Eva. I really am. It's the issue of the voice. And the voice and the body are in, in on the live stage. You just see um, a sloppiness basically, and you don't necessarily hear good voices. And I think that's that part, if that in the sense of um, the uh, training, especially for late bloomers, <clears throat> who usually do have quite, quite good voices, I have to admit, or at least mature, more mature voices, um, is um, <clears throat> I think with any of these uh, these uh, courses, that, that voice and movement needs to be added. And I haven't really seen that in a lot of places. Um, I try to incorporate voice uh, in, and movement into what I do in my classes because I just think it's actually an essential skill. And it is that old adage, if you haven't got a voice, then don't do it. But I don't think it is important for uh, working in uh, film and television. I might be, you can correct me. I mean, a good voice is a good voice, mm. basically. You know, where are the Alan Rickmans of this world? I mean, it just, it oh. does, it makes a huge difference, you know. And, uh, and I'm just, I just hate hearing bad voices. I will not train voices or voices that, you know, that worries me. Um, but I, 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 I think there's also, there's, in regarding working in the theatre, there's a thing about you could do endless courses, and, and they're all good courses, you know, in casting, especially for film and television, which is the dominant employer in Australia. But um, I think what gets also missed out a little bit, and this is a strange old Stanislavski term called the arc of the role, and so what I've started to do in some of my my classes here is actually do more play readings and simply uh, to give the actor a chance to take on the responsibility of doing a whole role over a whole play and work out what that progression is, which of course can relate to I should try it with a screenplay as well, actually, when I think about it, is to look at this issue of this arc of a role. And I don't 
I don't know. I'm not sure if the short courses are offering this type of thing. Um, I might be wrong. I might be wrong, but I've, I've decided that's what I've, I've started. To do. I've done that this year. I've done it twice now. And, um, with uh, the more in my in my classes, the more advanced students who've already done one year with me, and now we're looking at different things, such as taking the responsibility of learning the whole role. And one of the biggest things I'm going to say this now: the biggest gripes that I've got about everybody here, and especially in Adelaide, and hopefully it'd be hopefully be different elsewhere. Learn your bloody lines. Oh my god! <laughs> you know, I just want to shake people regarding not uh, how they think they can be an actor. And one other okay. thing, this is something that a lot of us old acting teachers have been talking about recently. Like Heath Davis has mentioned it and other people. And um, ask the question to you, young, to anybody, what was the last Australian film you saw? And it's really interesting what the response is. Um, it's, um, you'll always have some people who respond, like um, I asked this last night to a group of students and got Walks Out of Work Part 3. I went, I'm, I'm buying that one. Good on you for seeing it. And um, but even if you ask about have you seen The Stranger or I know Sissy's just been released, but I went to see it the other night. And um, and what is coming back about what is an Australian film is Elvis, <laughs> which, which is a bit problematic. But then so is Up for the Act Awards, so is 3,000 Years of Longing, which I thought was terrific. Mm. Elvis mm. is Baz, you know, so it's a taste. But um, it's that issue of... I firmly believe you are what you eat and trying to get this, I guess, the other advantage of um, a, a three year training, because you do get the history of theatre and you get the history of, of film and all that sort of stuff happens. Whereas otherwise, you've got to have be self, you've got to do it yourself. Mm -hmm. And um, I do think that's problematic that there is this great amnesia of people don't know about the past at all. Like you can, I can go, I swear to you, I can go into a class with 16 year olds and they have never, they don't even know who Kate Blanchett is. Wow. Wow. Yeah. We talked a lot about that in our discussion too, Tony, didn't we, with history. Yeah. Um, Stephen, I just want, me and you've followed a lot um, with the audition technique and now we're doing stage milk, which is a lot of training and a lot of self tapes, which is great post COVID, yeah. having that ability to do self tape. There's Tony sort of alluded to there about getting, back to working character and working story. I've been thinking lately that I've maybe taking the self-tape too far, that I do my self-tape and I get my review back from Greg or I get my review back from uh, the Stage Milk team. But I'm not, when, I, when I'm on set, I just did some student films and that, I'm going, oh my God, I haven't acted for a little while. I'm starting to think that I need to find a way to get in and start doing some scripts, start doing some live work. What, what do you think, Stephen? And Eva, I'll ask you that next as well. Yeah, well, I think certainly for for me, um, as I was saying earlier, the COVID, um, both 2020 and, and 2021, seemed to be a big, a big uh, boom in Queensland. But then things have moved back into a sense of normal again uh, and uh, some of those overseas productions that still here in the feature film but less in the in the series and so they're just they felt like coming into the bulk of 2022 there's been a lot less mm. a lot less that I've been uh, auditioning for or certainly a lot, a lot fewer that I've been cast in um, this year and so the other great love of mine that I that I had started back when I was 11 or 12 years of age on a manual Remington typewriter was script writing. Um, and they were basically really awful back then and hopefully that's improved. But I've, I, I've really gone in you know, head first into um, script writing, um, be it series, feature, short film, um, a, as a way of looking to, to get some of that funded, produced properly. Uh, and so as a way to try and get myself, force myself into um, a project, I'm trying to take ownership of the project to make it happen. So to, to, to really cover off every aspect of creativity that I possibly can, writing the thing and producing the thing and being in the thing to the point where I can try it until it kills me. And then I can just say, no, forget it. I just, I'm, now the creativity is now gone. Just tell, I just don't want to write anymore. Just put me somewhere and a director tell me what you want me to do. But so that's my, that's what I've been doing this mm. year um, to 
relative success in the, comp the script writing competition field. Awesome. Um, so I'm enjoying it at the moment. Awesome. And, um, do it. And it's one of those stories it. going back to what Tony said it. earlier. Yeah, that's so it's been it's been good, but as Tony said earlier, it's that point said, No, I, I think I think now I'm just gonna sit back and just I'm gonna I'm gonna gonna step back from things and then suddenly a few months later you look back and go, Oh my god, there's not enough hours in the day now because I'm now doing writing and I've got an attending this this producer's workshop and I'm and I'm editing this and I'm doing it's like So I'm looking forward to <laughs> relaxing. <laughs> relaxing somewhere sometime. But uh, anyway. <laughs> Awesome. Eva, Eva, what's your thoughts there about, you know, uh, probably making your own content and, and getting out of the, the circle of life in um, just doing self-tapes and, and, and training? Uh, get out of the circle. Well, I don't want to get out of the circle of, circle of self-tapes and training. I want to keep doing that. I want because I, I just That's good. keep that up. But, if it's, um, but I do highly recommend making your own content like everybody says write something write something for yourself write something that you want to do and i can't do that i can't i can't uh unbiasedly separate myself to write a role for myself i'd rather someone give me something and i'll write with it so when i did sit down to mm. write a script uh although i was writing from my experiences i wasn't writing for a role for me it was a story I had to get out and I knew exactly who I wanted to work with. And luckily in Adelaide, we do have a good community of filmmakers that we can draw on for experiences and to help us out and that type of thing. Uh, and so I grabbed some people that I worked with that I knew and said, look, I wrote this little script and they pointed me in the right direction. Uh, a few of them jumped on board wholeheartedly, gave their time. Thank you very much, and we managed to produce that little film, and it was cr so creatively satisfying. I don't have kids, <laughs> zero uh, desire to procreate, but just giving birth to this little creation was so satisfying. And I think it comes back to an adage my father taught me once: you need to go there to come back. So I went there, and I could keep going. But like I've said before, I keep going on tangents and I forget that acting is what I really want to do. So I've got to come back. Um, sorry, tangent again. But Stephen, I like, I'm really like, make make something, make it. Like you're writing these beautiful pieces. I, I highly recommend making it, getting people around you, funding, whatever you need to just make that one thing. Because I think every everyone in this sector, as an actor, as a writer, as a producer, Got to, has got to do it. I think it's great for actors to do it as well because they'll, they'll get that experience of what actually goes into it and what they can do with it. Mm. I, I love that because that was actually a, a question a bit further on um, at, that we've, we're now talking about content creation. And one of the points that I put down was I've got lots of ideas that I would love to make. I think that I lack a, a bit of a creative ability to write a story, um, to get the story arc and the character develop and everything like that. But my biggest bugbear, bugbears, I don't know if that's the right word, but is about trying to get a team on board to make my own work and putting that request out for wanted um, cameraman, cinematographers, sound people, volunteers. The old volunteer it's work, sick. there's so much out there. Mm -hmm. Sorry, interrupting Go. you. But you know them. You know everyone that could work on that film. From all the workshops that we've done, all the independent films we've done, all the student films mm. we've done, we know people. We've met people. We've done, oh, I really like what they did. I might see if they're interested in helping me out here. Or if this person here, this person there. I was lucky to have Mel Daly help me out. She asked me to be in her short web series, Inc. So, you know, I kind of milked her for ideas until she turned around and went, you know what, I might give you a hand. So, and that kind of work. And other people that are writing, you know, Rebecca Dunker, that we know the people. We know the people that are, are, are willing to help. You know, you, you, we we perform for them for free. Yeah, turn a favour. Mm. And I mean, that sounds a bit. And that's the toughest but... thing for. Yeah. Yeah. No, I the get toughest, that. The hardest um... thing is asking. The hardest thing is asking. But you've got the relationships with these people, so at least be comfortable talking to them about it. You know mm. what? Does that make so, sense? what's everyone's thoughts on on the? Yeah. No, definitely. So. Uh... Tony, uh, as a bit of an outsider from acting, so to speak, what do you see um, in content creation? I know you're involved with a great uh, group of actors and stuff that 
make it their shows. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. Stephanie and, and and Mark making their theatre shows all the time, and, and bringing in some money from that. But it's still a very a lot of there's no funding involved, is there? <laughs> Not yet, although we that's partly our fault because we just haven't necessarily pursued it. We've got sponsors, but mm. going down the uh, uh, looking for the gov- the grants situation is <laughs> I'm going to say something awful. And look, I'm sure they're really good, but there's a part of me that just goes, "Oh, let's not bother. Let's just try and get a private sponsor rather than doing all the government grant mm. stuff because it's so bureaucratic and in house and." It goes on. Um, look, you know, it, you're bringing up a really interesting point, and I don't, I don't necessarily have an answer for it. Have I done work for free? Yes, I have. Do I like it? Yes, I do. But would I rather be paid? Yes, I would. <laughs> um, uh, and so you've got it. And I and I'm very selective about what I do for free anyway. Um, so, but I do think it's a problem. I mean, you know, it's that whole thing about. I worry for actors because I mean, you do. A working actor is a working actor, so you kind of you've got to do the free gigs. I, I and I I, I I feel I think it's awful actually. You should be paid. Mm. You should be paid something, like even mm. if it's petrol money, no matter mm. what it is, is there should be some form of payment. And I I find that there's a level of abuse towards actors, the assumption that they'll do something for free. And I think that what we've seen over the COVID e- era is the um, and I'm going to be. Uh, ruthless here there's a contempt basically an assumption that all actors will do it for free and so you end up actually have thinking of acting as a hobby rather than as an art Mm. form Mm. or as a career Mm. i hate that i think i hate that so i what i then retreat to which is the thing for myself is i think about just concentrate on the art don't think about anything else because if you think about the money it's going to just get depressing you know and um or the lack of money. So uh, so that's why I try and encourage anybody. I always say to people, look, to any actor going, you know, if they've offered you a role, well, find out who the producer is, find out the content, da, 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 da. Then it's your choice if you're going to do it for free. But I don't think you should do it for free. It's that, that terrible promise, oh, it'll be good for your biog, it'll be good for your showreel, it'll be good for all that. Yeah. Well, that's rubbish, mm-hmm. you know, basically. Mm-hmm. But if it... But it, once again, things have changed. You know, the things have changed. There's all these short film festivals that go around the world now. And I'm looking at all young filmmakers and they're getting, they're getting their work seen in diff, on different mediums rather than just the cinema. So it's, I, oh, it's such a complex question. Mm. Basically, I don't want actors to do things for free. That's my, I don't Fair think enough. they should. And you're you right, know. you're right about the mediums changing. I just listened to a podcast uh, last mm. night from Cinema Australia for online funding and they, they're funding projects right down to the level of TikTok now and, and yeah. individual apps. So um, I think if, if you can find a way, like you said, if, if, even if it's just petrol money or finding a way to, to support the people involved and through my Facebook page, I get a lot of work come up saying wanted actors um, for a commercial car company or for a commercial cleaning agent and it, and it's a hundred dollars for a day's work and I go no nah, no nah. yeah this uh, is what we need to make sure is that actors are paid when it's a commercial arrangement if it's yeah. a if it's a volunteer arrangement with um, independent filmmakers exactly um, and we need to stay on top of that because Tony you're a photographer yourself photography was a big one because now it's very hard for professional photographers to get paid their work because there's so many photographers who are great at taking photos, who will do it for free. I think it was a couple of years ago, it came out in the media that Tennis Australia um, wanted um, volunteer photographers to take um, photos of the of one of the Grand Slams. Uh, and it yeah. was all put down as, oh, this will be great exposure for your work. So, oh, I hate that. Um, that's, that's, I hate that. Awesome. I want to move on a little bit. I'm, I'm mindful of the time. Um, and I, I wanted to ask the next question so that I can end on a, a, an uplifting question. But um, I just want to talk about uh, one of the biggest things that came out in most of the episodes during the year was um, mental health of, of actors, um, that uh, the well-being of actors. We discussed a lot. Uh, and I always put it as the ups and downs of the acting journey. Uh, uh, where the moments where actors start to doubt themselves. Um, we've already discussed how we're all fared coming out of COVID, but what's your thoughts on how actors can stay positive on this journey in those moments where you start to doubt yourself? Uh, Stephen, that this, me and you have had this discussion a lot as well. What's your thoughts there? 
Look, it's it, the trouble is it's a savage industry. Mm. Um, it, it, particularly, particularly for actors, but not just actors. It's it's savage for writers. It's savage for directors. It's savage for casting directors, producers. Um, it's we we often see just the the actor end of the straw um, as we're talking about with with um, funding um, with funding actors. Sorry, and um, I remember seeing that the you know the median. The median age for um, actors' salaries in Australia, the last financial year by the ATO, was just over twenty-eight thousand. Wow! So, and that's <laughs> that's the median salary. So it's in that environment where where you're spending. And I look at I've just done my uh, submitted my stuff for my accountant, and I look at how much I've spent to keep this acting afloat over this last year and think, Jesus Christ, that's a lot of money. Um, thankfully, I made more money than I spent out from acting, so well, that's, that, that that's, helps. That's always good. Um, but in that, in that environment, when you look at the fact that it's an environment that is predicated on rejection and on failure and that you are more likely to fail in this on any given day than you are to succeed, that's really, really tough. It's extremely tough. And um, on on well-being is for actors, you know, I've because of, of previous work that I was doing in the sp well-being space, you know, I've developed um, a um, an actor's guide to well-being and resilience. But it's no different than a lot of sectors. It's just that we we are combating it on a day-to-day -day basis. Mm. Uh, and it's about recognizing what your own measure of success is. Now, if your measure of success is that you um, are going to get that Oscar, then whew, be prepared for some rocky, rocky times. Mm. Um, but if your measure of success is this week, I'm going to put something down on tape and practice my acting chops. Well, you can achieve that. It's, it's, it's something that's tangible, it's something that's measurable, and that you're learning and you can feel good about coming out the other end saying, yeah, I did that, that's fantastic. No one may have seen it, but if that's, it's about trying to look at what your goals are and what do you need to do to actually get to those goals. Um, it's, it's also really important to think and to plan at, whether it's the start of every year or however long you, you, it takes you to do it, but. I'm a big believer in, in um, writing down um, on a vision board or something, things that, things that you'd aspire to, things that, that you'd really like to have happen and to tell people about it. Mm. Because these things have a way of happening. Yep. You know, back in the day when I was um, career coaching people in, in um, the corporate sector, actually understanding where you want to be and then telling people about it miraculously resulted in lots of people ending up following their dreams or getting that gig or so on. Um, you know, and, and they, they can be unrealistic, but they're not really unrealistic. I had vision boards a couple of years ago where I was putting NBC and Netflix and so on, and I was telling people about it and telling my agent about it and telling anyone that would listen. And within 12 months, I had an NBC um, uh, speaking role and had a Netflix speaking role. Well, there you go. Um, Works. It, it, they, they happened. Did it cause it? No. But, you know, if there's enough juju out there to make things. And I am I am not a tree-hugging kind of <laughs> airy-fairy kind of guy. I'm just not that guy. Um, but it, it's about actually being able to legitimately manifest stuff by telling people around it, around you, telling your family, telling your friends, telling your co-workers, telling your other actors, telling your coaches and people that you meet that this is where I want to be. Stuff happen, opportunity happens. Mm. So I think I think you can try this. You can't you can't stop the rejection, but you can recognise what's important and what's valuable to you, and stay one step ahead. Yeah, and I, that's interesting because um, uh, I had a big chat with Eva, and Tony knows about this as well. Stephen, I, I I don't think I brought it to you, but I was recently told um, by someone influential in my acting uh, circle of that um, I'm not standing out. I'm not standing out in acting and I'm not standing out 
as as an actor. Uh, and this information was apparently from casting directors for my submissions. Mm-hmm. And that sent me into a spiral, a, a big dive. And I, um, Eva, you probably have a chat about that. So um, how I had to deal with that and how I had to find a way to come out of it. And I think a, a lot of the stuff that both you, yourself and Tony sort of mentioned to me was exactly what you've just talked about, Tony, uh, Stephen, sorry, is about recognising what you're doing and what you're enjoying from the world and, and then moving on that. Um, Eva, what's your thoughts? Well, we had kind of a similar, well, not a similar experience, but we both went through a spiral. Um, you and I, mm. different circumstances. And it, 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 and it is exactly what we talked about. We do it because we love it, not for any other reason. Yeah. We love it. We love acting. We love performing. We love going into the history. We love going into the character. We love going into the story. And like, you've you just got to pull yourself back and go, why am I doing this? Because I fucking love it. So I'm going to find something yeah, to do. Exactly. That. I'm going to read a book. I'm going to read a script. I'm going to do a self-tape on my own. I'm going to reach out to a friend. And uh, yeah. Vincent was very, Vincent Donato was very keen in helping me come out of that. And in, in that we would send each other self-tapes and give each other positive critique. Um, but just to help get back into that. So it's just, it's, 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 and like you say, Stephen, rejection sucks. Everybody gets it. It's just how you come out of it. Well, okay, I didn't get that part. Or this thing happened. That it's, it's, it's in the past now. It's not going to stop me doing what I want to do because I really want to do it. Yeah. Let's just keep doing it. Let's just find these little things that, like, I started making bloody videos and I know they're stupid and I'm not doing it to be famous but I'm creating something and I'm performing which is what I love to do and writing as well and it's just just find that one little thing that like Steve said just that one little thing <clears throat> that you love doing about acting anything mm-hmm. to do with it and yeah. that I think that and, that's key and and what you touch on uh, is I think acting, unlike any other career in any other profession that I've ever done, acting is the only one where I have zero control over any outcome. Mm -hmm. Everything else I've ever done in a whole range of different careers, um, I've had control. Mm -hmm. And so it goes to the heart of what is in my sphere of control as an actor? What can I control? Because there's a whole lot of stuff I can't control and I can worry about and I can fret about and I can lose sleep about that, that I, I can't influence, I can't do anything. And so I try to focus on what are the things that I can control? And that is, I'm gonna do some acting today or I'm gonna read a, read a play. I'm gonna yeah. go and see a play. I'm gonna do this, I'm gonna reach out. I'm gonna I'm going to, you know, spruce up my CV. I'm going to get some headshots. I'm gonna do this, I'm gonna do that. I'm gonna network with actors. Yeah. These are all things you can control. And when we start to control and influence something, that sphere of influence starts to grow and expand. I love it. I love um, I love how we've we've pulled some information and some and some pointers for people to put a positive spin on what we all go through as actors, uh, which is exactly what I got from you guys. Tony, uh, what's your thoughts there? You work with actors all the time. So just even even when actors have those moments on stage when they're, they're slogging out the lines and trying to get through and the show's starting tomorrow night and they have those moments, how do you work with actors on the ground, so to speak, to, to get through those moments when they have that doubt about themselves? Oh, look, there, uh, it, on one issue of stage fright, there's a couple of things I do use. Um, and actors do good, do good. You know, stage fright can stop whole careers, actually, if ever working in live theatre again. Mm. But um, what, what everyone's been talking about, which has been marvellous, is the thing is how do you deal with that issue of depression and self-doubt and, um, and unemployment or rejection is you've got to stay active. You've actually simply just got to stay active. But that's not always easy. And I think, I mean, I... I've got my garden, which is behind me, and I, that's what I get a lot of satisfaction out of. If, I, if I'm feeling a bit down, off I'll go into the garden and I live near a beach, so off I go into the water. Um, 
that's all. I'm, I'm an old surfer from Bondi, for God's sake. So, you know, I, I use those things that I've always used, which is if I can get to the water and then I'm going to be fine. Um, look, the other thing about all of us, whether we actors, no matter what we are, we are always going to live with self-doubt. And it's actually how you manage self-doubt. And um, and I'm even just on this, getting back to what you asked me, David, about I remember I was standing in the wings with somebody, I'm not going to say it was a, fa it's a famous actor, and they were freaked out. And, you know, and they had a little bit of time. So I took them aside and it was just a very quick chat and breathing and things like that. And I said, you know, the thing is about leaving performance, whether it be live or in front of a camera, it's, it is, has a live experience that it's always going to have this sense of you're going to leap, you're, you're about to, you know, dive into the swimming pool and you don't know what's going to happen, right? And there's a good side of it. Kate Blanchett's been talking about this recently regarding uh, Tark and the and the messiness of it. And there and you know you do all your preparation, you get all well prepared, but there is that moment where you've just actually got to leap, and um, and you don't know how it's going to end up. But I think that's what we live with all the time. I t and I don't think, and I'm sorry to say at 65, even having just gone through an opening night, it never goes away. And then there's that issue of why the hell am I doing this for God's sake? And I, there's, I think there's a valid perverse side to us that we actually enjoy the thrill. We enjoy the thrill of self-doubt. Mm. There's, there's a side to it that actually is a very important part of being uh, in the performing arts, no matter what you're doing. There is that element of self-doubt that you've got to manage, I agree, but it's never going to go away. I guess just like got to... athletes, you know, every time someone jumps out of a plane for parachuting or, or they go to Absol down that cliff, they no matter how many times they've jumped out of that plane or no matter how, how many times they've jumped off that cliff, they have that moment of, oh, this could be the time that I do it wrong or something. So it's just a matter of knowing that you've you've built yourself up to do it and you know yeah. you can do it and just do it and, and, and leap. And also just con don't listen to outside sources. When you're involved in a creative process of something and you're collaborating with others, don't listen to anybody else. Mm. You know, that's why I always say don't read the critics. Don't have anything to do with it until, we're after, until it's all over. I think it's only those involved in the creative process can actually inform the creative process. And I think that's really good. And also where I go back to, and we've talked about this before, David, this is just for me and why I go on and on about the history of theatre and history of film. I retreat to the art because that's where I, that's where I started, that first thrill of going to the theatre and seeing magnificent things and so And I can always learn more because it's so huge. It's so massive regarding the performing arts, especially theatre or a film. And... Um, I mean, you know, I'm right. I'm, I, as we've talked about, I love South Korean films. I'm so into them, and uh, so I, I can't wait to see the next, you know, the next series. Or, yeah, awesome. and, and and trying to encourage others. I, I I go in all my classes. I begin with this uh, thing. A lot of us do this now. Is at least a half an hour talking about well, what have you seen and what have you done, and we are what we eat in a way. And uh, so, hence, I will always talk about. You know, I'll say, okay, we're going to talk Alfred Hitchcock. And, you know, and say, go away and watch it and watch you know, something by Alfred Hitchcock and come back in next week to discuss it. And uh, so I always retreat to the art with this issue of going, we've got to fire our imaginations. We've got to feed our imaginations in order to create better work. And, uh, and I know that sounds all very, very altruistic and a bit wanky, but that's how I deal with it. So if I actually am feeling elements of self-doubt, it is like what the others are saying. I, I get active, I go into the garden, or I'll find something that I don't know, or a play or a film that I'd like to rewatch. Like I, I just rewatched Citizen Kane again, partly because, you know, I had to. But and I'm a ma every. I don't know how many times I've seen Citizen Kane. I don't know how many times it's like not as many as Gone with the Wind, but I've seen Citizen Kane probably equally amount. Mm. And I always find something different. And I think that's a mark of, of greatness. And that's what I think is also important is for all of us to aspire to greatness. And and I'm also just on another level, oh, sorry, I'm just on that greatness level, but we will never know what greatness is unless you have that resources to watch a Citizen Kane or to know what greatness is, to measure yourself against it. And that's what you aspire to. So hence, I always go back to the art. The other thing that I'm, I've sort of, knowing my very infamous Facebook rants, I've got a, um, uh, I've got a, uh, Something that Catherine Hepburn said has struck with me just recently. 
and um, and some it's a little bit what Stephen referred to earlier is um, I've stopped I've stopped complaining. I've stopped complaining because I don't think I think it's I think it's counterproductive, actually, mm. and uh, and it's easy to go into. We live in a culture of complaint, and I think it's actually very easy to indulge in it, and things could always be better. But I've actually making a, a really strong effort not to complain, and it's something that Kierkegaard said that, that David that Stephen mentioned that it struck it just sounded a resonance. Kierkegaard said that when you make a decision. It's amazing how the universe then conspires to assist you, and um, that's that struck a resonance with me too, as in the sense of not complaining, and also just being positive. When you make a decision, I'm going to put on a show, or I'm going to do a, I'm going to go out and do a photographic essay or something. Um, it's amazing. It is amazing how things start to suddenly to come together, mm. and it, as long as you actually make that decision, that step forward, being active again. I love it. So that's awesome. a. Oh, yeah. Thanks, guys, for that. That was uh, that was awesome to to get the positiveness out of what was a, a really a, a negative question and something that actors go through every day is that self doubt and and when when getting a role can just boil down to a producer saying I don't like his or her nose or their eye colour. Um, you've you've got to realise that you, you did not get the role because you can't act. You just didn't get the role because your eyes are brown as opposed to blue. Um, I'm mindful we're coming up to an hour, guys. I'd, I'd like to ask just one more question before we um, uh, switch to have a quick um, goodbye from each of you. Uh, Tony said in his uh, discussion with me um, that actors need to find their permission to play. Um, it, Tony, if you can just quickly explain that um, just so the, the other guys have got something to work on. What do you do to bring your characters to life to make them real on stage or screen tony uh, just explain quickly how you meant um the actor needs to find their permission to play well it's very much in the rehearsal room and the relationship with the fellow actor and the collaboration in that, that particular rehearsal moment is um i think it's the responsibility of a director to set it up or set that rehearsal room up with the other actors that they have permission to play and you've sometimes got to say that and allow, okay, make a mistake. Let's let's throw this out. Not necessarily let's go in and improvise, but let's let's try things a different way. Let's try. Let's just let's be a bit more creative and inventive rather than thinking of end result. This is me being very much a theatre director. I know you don't have in film and television. You don't necessarily have that time. Mm. But look, to be honest, David, every time I've worked work, worked on the small bits of uh, film thing that I've done in Adelaide, you know, especially with Aaron, it's it's always been playful. I think, and I think that's actually extremely important. You know, and Aaron, as a film director, is very, very encouraging of, at least he has been to me, of allowing me to relax on, on camera and, and muck around and make mistakes. Uh, I think that's, I just think that's a really important thing a director's got to do is to make sure that the actor feels, because unless there's play, there's no creativity, because the imagination's going to be stilted and it's going to be awful of, oh, I've got to get this right and I've got to get this corrected and all that sort of stuff. And I'm, I walk around, well, let's not get it right. Let's get it massively wrong and see what happens. And that's funny. And, uh, Aaron was uh, in his interview. He said exactly that. As a director, he says the biggest thing he wants to tell actors is know your bloody lines. Which is going back to the start of the interview, Tony. You said that, um, Stephen. How do you like to find ways to play as an actor? Yeah. Look, I think it it's might not be on set because that just comes down to what set it is. Whether it's a you know, if you're on an Aaron Sorkin set, I mean, wouldn't we love to? Oh, yeah. But um, you're not, yeah, not going to yeah. be free to play with the text. <laughs> so yeah. it depends where you're at. Uh, whereas if you're on a student film, you might be, hey, guys, I think uh, this cop might say things this way, not this way. But um, I've given myself permission a while back now to play in the audition process. Um, partly pinch some of those ideas of Greg's around the creating what I see could be a really interesting character for this for this uh, particular portrayal um, and to just play with it, to, to, to um, potentially be a little bit freer with the text because it's just an audition, um, to be freer with costuming and even, even these days location and of where I'm shooting it. Um, the, the most recent thing I was cast in was a farmer for a TV commercial. So I sure. shot it out the front of a farm, mm. you know, um, and and so I've learned of just relaxing, relaxing into it to recognize that I'm having fun. 
I'm playing the character and I may never get another opportunity to play the character. So you know, we're here for shits and giggles. Let's just have fun and enjoy it. And, um, and it's working, um, you know, creative, creative in my, in the audition, creative in the slate. And um, yeah, it's, I have fun. It's easier. It's not a job. It's just fun playing and being creative as well. And, 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 they generally work because mm, uh, we were there for a point there where um, your self tape had to be in front of your grey background, had to be strictly this and that. But um, COVID brought out so many self tapes that I think the casting directors are just getting sick of the grey background yeah. and the and the standard self tape. So yeah. I, I think it all boils down to as long as I can see you're acting. Yeah. That's correct, isn't it? So uh, Eva, yeah. what's your thoughts there? How do you find a way to play? Uh, I. I... <clears throat> I look at the, I do something different. If you're given a role that's a couple of lines, but not given a role, but if you're given an audition piece that is a, is a doctor, a lot of people are just going to go in and say, like a doctor. Well, what if you're like the quirky doctor or the neurodiverse doctor? I can say that. Uh, or, or you're the, the, you know, the doctor, and it's that thing, that bad day kind of thing, bringing in more of those kind of elements that you know, people are different and personalities are different. I think just do it like a doctor or do it like a farmer. Just, just do it, try something different. And, and I enjoy that process. And I did that once in a workshop. I did the whole, you know, kooky doctor thing. And I went a bit overboard. And the tutor says, oh, this is a great idea. It's not working. Well, let's try this way. And I liked being moulded in that way. And it worked in the end. So my idea worked, but not the way I was executing it. But given the right guidance, it worked. So I like I like to probably just go to the extreme and think of something the most different thing that I can do as long as a, there's a story behind it as long as there's a reason for it but I'll take it as far as I can and trust in the director or the tutor to bring me back I don't know if I love that's it. awesome good but yeah no that's good. Awesome. Well, thank you very much, guys. I'm mindful we've just gone over the hour. I just want to wrap this up quickly with um, a moment from each of you. If you wish to say, we'll go from left to right on my screen. Uh, Tony, uh, in a, a minute or two, um, you just want to have something to say to uh, the listeners of the podcast. Uh, I'm happy for you to be whatever you want, whether it's towards uh, late bloomers or acting. Uh, just round out 2022 and, and for something for actors to take away. Never stop believing, quite simply. Never stop believing. And and always be open to new adventures. Awesome. Thank you. I keep saying beautiful. Uh, I, had to, I had to put a thing on Twitter the other day. What's something you do in your podcast that you hate doing? I, said, I keep saying beautiful, beautiful, beautiful. Uh, thank you, Tony. Uh, Stephen? You can call me beautiful, darling. Hey, beautiful. It's all right. <laughs> <laughs> For me, I think the most important thing is to actually find your tribe. Hmm. Surround yourself with the people who are going to be supporting you and not bringing you down. That's we'll stop. true. Awesome. And, and they can be online, as we know. Of course. Mm. Awesome. And, and I think um, in Stage Milk, uh, Steve and I have grown um, to be great mates through our um, uh, Stage Milk. I think we're like considered the senior members almost now. So uh, it's fantastic, the journey that we've had. And and I've, we've said this both online in our podcast we haven't met yet have we Stephen? you haven't met but it's like we're great mates so i love i've seen you a few times at adelaide airport and i've run the other direction (laughs) a lot of people do uh eva doesn't run from me when she sees me at the airport uh what's your thoughts to round this up no you run from me at the airport i i look the the boys summed it up perfectly like it's it's just do it just do it because you love it. And if you don't love it, find something you do love. It's, I don't know, hang in there. Mm. <laughs> it's all about me. I don't know. The, the boys have said it all. Uh, I got nothing at that. Awesome. I suck at this. Awesome. I can't say it's on and the it, 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 but... No, no, that's good. It's and and I'll, I reckon I'll, I'll finish it off quickly. <laughs> you know that as soon as we uh, end this, you go, oh, I should have said this. Um, no, that's, that's fantastic. I think one of the biggest things I took out of this was um, uh, when I reached out for people um, in relation to the what we discussed before, uh, Andrew Hurl, who um, unfortunately couldn't be here today, he said 
look, uh, your acting is, is, is great. There's no problems with your acting. I see all your work. You're fantastic. You've really got something to bring to characters, and I think we all do. He says, you need to put it into perspective. There are actors out there that have been doing this since they were teenagers, when, uh, especially for me, I'm a uh, 50-year-old Caucasian male. We're a dime a dozen. So I'm up against the best of the best there are when these auditions are coming in. So it doesn't mean I'm a bad actor. It means that you're in a, uh, you're, you're fighting with a lot of other actors and it can boil down to just the colour of your eyes or something like that. So um, I'm going to keep on going on because I love what I'm doing. I love the people that I meet. Uh, I love doing the podcast and everything that's involved. So um, that's what I've take away from this. So uh, Tony, Stephen, Eva... Thank you very much for coming on board. Um, I haven't seen this done with other podcasts before where they've brought guests back from the year. So uh, I, I'm thinking that this is wonderful. I'm really appreciative that you guys came on board. So thank you. Um, I think we're going to say goodbye. If you guys want to say goodbye to each other and then um, we'll wrap right. up. Nice to you, Stephen and Eva. Bye. Love your work, Bye-bye. guys. Thank you very much. And everyone <laughs> listening, uh, thank you for being on board for 2022. This has uh, been 12 wonderful episodes of the podcast. I really supportive uh, and thank you for coming on board and listening to all these great people that you see in front of you now or that you've just listened to if you're listening to the podcast. So all the best, everyone, David. for 2023. Thank yeah, you. Yeah, congratulations, congratulations, David. This is wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. Goodbye. Thank you.